If I asked you to define autism, could you do it? You should stay tuned for the next edition of Health Watch. Hello, I'm Terry Taffer Anderson, and this is Health Watch. The Virginia Department of Education reports that the number of children and young people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder enrolled in Virginia's public schools has seen a steady increase. As of December 1st, 1998, that number was 1,521. By December 1st, 1999, it had increased to 1,953. One year later, on December 1st, 2000, there were 2,226 people with autism spectrum disorder enrolled in Virginia's public schools. As of December 1st, 2001, there was another increase, up to 2,710. And the number has continued to rise every year to 3,350 in 2002, 4,420 in 2003, 5,179 in 2004, and 5,968 in 2005. Finally, by December 1, 2008, the number of children with autism spectrum disorder enrolled in Virginia's public schools realized a dramatic increase, a leap of up to 9,136. But the number continues to rise. It is because of this most noteworthy situation that we are going to do something quite extraordinary and unprecedented on Health Watch. This is the first edition of a very special three-part series on autism. On today's premiere edition of the show, we're going to examine its definition, assessment, evaluation, treatment, and interventions. During the second part of the series, we're going to explore autism from a parent's perspective, take a look at adults on the spectrum, and review the support and community resources that are available for both children and adults. But the final entry of this special three-part series will be something very special indeed. It will be a rare, hour-long edition of Health Watch, one that will feature a live studio audience, as well as highlight some rather extraordinary people with autism. So, sit back and take this journey with us, and be sure to catch every edition of this unprecedented series. Please also tell all of your friends. As we step boldly into this arena, I've asked some autism experts to join me for this premiere edition. My guests today are Teresa Zeno McMillan, Vice President of the Autism Society Tidewater and a Medicaid mentor with that agency, as well as a family navigator with the Virginia Commonwealth University Partnership for People with Disabilities Center for Family Involvement. Next up is Dr. John Harrington, Professor of Pediatrics at the Eastern Virginia Medical School and Division Director of the EVMS General Academic Pediatrics at the Children's Hospitals of the King Daughters. Dr. Katrine Hartman, a clinical psychologist and an associate professor and the co-director of the Autism Spectrum Disorder Program at the Eastern Virginia Medical School, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. And Dr. Eric Madrin, a family physician with Bayview Physicians based in the offices of the Princess Anne Medical Associates. Welcome to Health Watch, guys. Well, Thank we've you. had an opportunity to talk a lot about this topic as we prepare for this show, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, but the way that I like to pretend is to get a personal perspective from each of you as to why you are involved in, in this, uh, this, this field, this, this medical arena. Uh, Teresa, let's begin with you. Um, you are particularly interested in the community resources and support, but tell us, what is your personal connection to autism? We came into the autism world about nine years ago with our little girl, Izzy. Uh, once we came in, we didn't realize how many resources and dollars it was going to take to take care of the therapies she needed. Um, within two years, we blew through savings and our older kids' college savings, as well as taking out loans to pay for therapy. So I went out to reach out to other support groups to find out how other families were doing it. Certainly I couldn't be the only one struggling to get therapies paid for. And after networking with the Autism Society, shortly afterwards I realized there, there might be some waiver services for our children. And as mentored by Joanna and Jan, I filed for Medicaid. Um, and that's where it all started, our journey. Um, six months where there were so many uh, different conflicting stories, I was taken down different roads, only to find out later on it would have been streamlined had somebody at the office taken the time to talk to us. Um, Izzy was approved for Medicaid waiver and uh, we now have medical expenses paid for, for Izzy and I swore at that time 
that I wouldn't let another family go through the same process. So what was a six month process for me has in turn turned into a six to eight week process for families that come to the Autism Society and seek um, help. Uh, the Autism Society sent me away to Richmond DMAS to get some training on the mm -hmm. waiver so now we can help families in our community. Um, to date I've helped about 500 families through the system. Um, some ranging um, between 2 and 18 years old, local, Richmond, Charlottesville, and uh, Arlington, Virginia as well. Um, and as long as families come to the Autism Society, we can help them through the process and much needed services for our children. Her name is Izzy. Izzy. I love it. Yeah, I Izzy. Love it. Now, you also mentioned uh, Joanna and Jan. Who, who are they? Joanna was a uh, prior president, um, probably right when I came into the system. Of the Autism, Autism Society. Autism Society. And, and Jan. Jan was a board member I and see. vice president when I first came into the system. Okay. One other question, just for our viewers that don't know uh, DMAS. You mentioned DMAS. What is that? Department, Medi Department of Medical Assistance Services. Uh -huh. It's Medicaid I up see. in Richmond. I see. Uh, now, you have a daughter with autism. That is unusual, is it not? Isn't there a predominance of boys? Sure. Uh, CDC in March 2012 reported that uh, autism occurs in 1 in 88 children. That means 1 in 54 boys. Uh, the prevalence for autism among boys is five times more than is girls. Mm -hmm. When we started in the um, autism world about nine years ago, there was just a few of us. Now I see um, dozens of girls on the spectrum. I, I want to go right down the line here, um, the way I have you guys set up. Uh, um, Dr. Harrington, uh, what is your, your, your personal relationship to autism? Well, I, I first want to say thanks for inviting all of us. It's always nice to have a collaborative effort, you know, for autism in the community. And, you know, hopefully a lot of people will take advantage of hearing all the experts here today, you know, give them information that's, you know, um, for the people in the, uh, Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, my personal experience is related to my son, Sean. And it probably started about 16 years ago when he was about 18 months old um, and realizing that he had stopped talking and he wasn't looking at us and he was doing his own little sort of behaviors by himself that, you know, I wanted someone to diagnose him uh, and I was having trouble getting my community of physicians who were supposed to be experts at that time to diagnose him with something called autism, uh, which seemed like should only be a diagnosis of exclusion in, at that time. Um, mm. So in reality, um, he was seen and, and told and was told to have just a language disorder um, and that was really hard to swallow uh, knowing that there were a lot of other things going on with him and so now moving forward and fast forwarding um, after getting some therapy and having devoted uh, uh, wife and mother taking care of him on a, on a regular basis he's improved and um, when I teach residents and medical students about screening and diagnosing autism um, I put a lot more effort into it knowing that getting that diagnosis and moving forward with the right therapies and the right treatments is going to make a huge difference um, in that child's outcome and the whole family's outcome. So it's interesting that you as a physician, uh, and I know yourself, Dr. Madge, we'll get to you in just a second as a physician that has a child with autism, you know, found it also challenging to, to get the, the appropriate attention that your son needed. Yeah, Terrence, 16 years ago, you know, we were not talking about an autism epidemic, um, even though I don't consider it an epidemic. I think it's just a, an, an idea of learning how to diagnose something that's been there probably and how to sort of move forward and get the right training and screening and uh, therapies for kids at an early age. And thanks to our good friends at uh, WTKR TV Channel 3, uh, we're going to feature Sean and a highlight on the one hour special. Uh, it's a swimming. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yes, master. Um, Dr. Hartman, Katrin, um, what is your relationship to, uh, do you have a personal uh, connection to autism? My connection is probably my passion for working with children and um, adolescents. I love working with them and over time as a clinical psychologist just more children came to me or would be seen by me who have an autism spectrum feature mm. and I love about that f working with the families with ASD that um, it's such a treatable um, disorder if you want to call it that mm. and okay. to see the the hope in the families after we diagnose them um, that they can go forward with that and get treatment okay and Dr. Madden I mentioned that you have a son as well with autism and he is going to be featured in the uh, in the online special that we're going to do in a couple of months, uh, playing cello. T tell us about your own uh, your own personal uh, 
intervention in relationship with autism. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, our experience was fairly similar to what Dr. Harrington described. Um, my wife is also a physician, and you'd think we have some sort of inside track into recognizing and pursuing appropriate treatments, but we were just as bewildered as anybody. And uh, our son, uh, back in the in the 90s, went through a you know very extensive evaluation uh, by s specialists, uh, both in Charlottesville, where we lived when he was younger, as well as here in Hampton Roads. And uh, uh, his developmental delays were very apparent to us, mm -hmm. uh, and were apparent to the specialists as well. But there seemed to be this reluctance to use the the term autism. I came to call it the A word because it was the word nobody wanted to say. Uh, even though it was uh, eventually became very obvious to us. A and even going through that process, uh, I just got the feeling that there just weren't enough physicians who were comfortable both diagnosing and treating this condition. And I, I began to look for ways that I could help my own son in terms of uh, treatment. And, and that's what brought me into the field of treating patients with autism. And, and now it's become a big part of my practice. About um, probably close to half of my patients currently are on the spectrum of autism, both children and adults. Um, and it's uh, really been a very rewarding field of practice. I echo Dr. Uh, Hartman's comments about this is a very treatable condition, mm -hmm. uh, and it makes it uh, a really uh, enjoyable experience to be able to work with families and see their children improve. Uh, you mentioned that your wife is a physician as well. She is. Uh, is her special family practice? or is Her specialty is uh, hospital-based medicine. She's okay. an intern. She's a, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we uh, been talking about this uh, kind of in generalities, and there are a lot of folks that are, simply have no idea what autism is. And I think this is probably a good time to come up with the best definition that we can for autism. And Dr. Harrington, you mentioned the DSM-4 and DSM-5, the, the, that there are distinctions between those definitions of autism. Could you share with us what those distinctions are, and, and also tell us what the acronym DSM stands for? for you? <laughs> Um, I don't know if I qualified, but uh, the di DSM stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Mm. Um, it's going to go under a revision uh, in May of 2013, so in several months we should have a new uh, DSM. And so that DSM-5 is going to change some of the things that we now see in the DSM-4. Mm -hmm. um, for example, um, the DSM-4 now kind of states there's three areas of autism that we utilize, or three areas that, um, uh, that are impacted by autism. And that's in social uh, interactions, impairment, um, impairment in communication, and then repetitive and restrictive behaviors um, that many of us as parents realize are you know, some of the more maddening problems of autism. Um, in the DSM-5, they're going to sort of combine some of these and now call it a social and communication interaction problem, and then increase the need for repetitive and restrictive behaviors. So now there'll be more criteria to meet along those avenues. Mm -hmm. and, um, the other thing that they want to do that has created a little bit of a storm is changing some of the words that we use like pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified and Asperger's and classic autism or autistic disorder and subsuming them, that's the term that they use, into one um, full term called autism spectrum disorder. Um, many people who like using those terms where they felt there was some type of severity um, attached to them, feel that this is going to be a, a, a difference and change that's not going to be good. Um, I feel that they're also adding into that um, a level of severity to the autism spectrum disorder. So they'll be low, medium, and severe. Understood. Um, I'm sorry, low, medium, and high functioning. Mm -hmm. um, so that they'll still be able to sort of have that. So. Um, it's going to be a new terminology that many of us medical people have to get used to saying and feeling comfortable with. Um, I think it, it, it'll be kind of a tough sell initially to most people, um, but I think it, I think it will um, generally make it easier to sort of um, place people onto the spectrum and place them in an area of the spectrum that allow them to get the right um, treatments and the right modalities for them. Uh, and we're hoping that it'll be embraced by insurance companies and parents and, and everybody uh, to the like. I, I, at least, I'm, I didn't write any of the DSM-5. Okay. Um, they also increased the need for um, sensory things. We know that a lot of our kids have sensory problems, mm -hmm. pressure issues, uh, noise issues, um, 
things related to um, texture and stuff like that. Early on, I think a lot of these things do um, get better over time, but uh, generally at the beginning, we do see these areas um, um, that are abnormal in children, mm -hmm. um, and those are sort of now going to become part of the diagnosis. Um, it was not part of the DSM-4 before. Before, um, except there. Okay, fine. Uh, and again, we're going to have opportunities to talk about a lot more of this and get in, in, in even more uh, detail a, a little later on. Um, Teresa, what was it about Izzy's uh, behavior? What, what kind of signs uh, did you see that there might be something that's a little amiss? Well, personally, I consider Izzy's um, a regressive type of autism. She was progressing at a typical pace met her milestones. She was chatting, uh, gesturing. She was playing with her older siblings. Then about 17 months, she uh, stopped talking entirely, um, became withdrawn, and preferred to be isolated. Um, so there were no more hugs, no more chasing, no more giggling around the house. Uh, and most critical of all, she just lost her ability to communicate with us. We knew something had changed. Uh, that, uh, not to convolute or confuse things here, but, but that seems like if she was progressing at a, uh, at a typical pace, that seems to suggest that there was some kind of trigger that, that prompted this. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no way to define anything at all like that. It's, it's just the, the, the occurrence, a spontaneous right. occurrence? I believe for each child it's different. Uh -huh. um, and so we spent a majority of our time trying to figure out and listed the, the changes that occurred, and um, I did a little bit of research too to figure out what might have triggered the changes and try to recover some of the lost abilities. But I think for every child, it's a little different. Um, Dr. Madrin, uh, that being the case, uh, being different for each child, did you, you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, what was it about your son that, uh, that prompted you? Well, uh, Teresa's described uh, what some people uh, term the regressive variant uh, of autism. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my son's development was different. We had uh, signs even at a very early age in his first year of life that he mm -hmm. was developmentally delayed. Um, actually back then uh, the thing that was most apparent to us was his delay in motor development. Oh really? Uh, ben was very late to uh, roll over. He was very late to uh, pull up to standing and he was very late to walk. And uh, I can recall back then that uh, you know, family members and friends you know, constantly asking about how's your son doing and would ask the simple question of, hey, is he walking yet? And I got so tired of saying, no, he's not, no, he's not. And my wife and I were so focused on that that I think to some degree we, went, we missed the forest for the trees. Uh, he walks just fine now. Yeah. That's not a concern any longer. But, but it wasn't as obvious to us uh, back then as it is now, his delays in his language development, his delays in his socialization skills, the repetitive uh, behaviors that Dr. Harrington described. Dr. Hartman, what kind of screenings are there for the initial screenings for autism? There are a lot of different ones. Um, they are like um, commercially available or by test developers developed um, screening tools. Some of them are actually three, like the modified um, checklist of autism in toddlers. But I think um, most of us, and this is probably true for um, many physicians, pediatricians, a really good clinical interview actually goes a long way. So people oftentimes go after like um, a child who isn't walking around the one year mark or a child who doesn't use single words by one year or put words together by two years or use three words by three a little ne memo that we teach, um, I guess, students, that um, then um, we hone in and ask other questions, such as about the repetitive behaviors or sensory difficulties, like covering your ears when you come into a crowded room and or there are neon lights, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So the screening tools are there, and they're very good. Um, in fact, I think you, Dr. Harrington, use a lot of the MCAT um, in the office. Um, M MCAT being? The modified checklist for the autism, um, okay. for autism mm -hmm. and toddlers. It's like an early detection instrument at like 18 months of age or earlier. But that really, um, mostly, it's by sensitizing the community and the parents to things that raise red flags flags or that are a little bit amiss and then following that up and seeing like the big picture could there be other things that the child is missing out on and are doing that are repetitive or kind of like odd or quirky Understood. 
Yeah. So yeah, we've um, the modified checklist for autism in toddlers is now something that many of the people from the AAP and family practice and stuff will use at the 18-month visit, the 24-month visit, or the 30-month visit. And it's actually, there's one online that parents could go to if they wanted to at least screen their child. Um, and I tell parents this all the time, it's www.m-chat.org. And you can actually go on the website and take the 23 yes, no questions. Um, most of the things are related to joint attention skills that we're looking for in a, in a visit. I, I, like, I like to do a sort of active visit mm -hmm. um, where you're trying to find these things. You know, is the child responding to their name? Are they pointing for objects? We call it proto-declarative pointing if they actually point for what they want. Using this finger apparently is very important. Uh, for our for our growth and uh, learning things and stuff. Mm -hmm. What's that? What's that? What's that? Um, if kids are not doing that, it's it's a problem, and it should be a red flag for you to um, think about autism in a child that's pro pulling you over to things and not using language and really pointing and not really looking you in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, all these things are now trying to be utilized as early screeners uh, for kids with autism. That joint attention skill. Um, it won't necessarily pick up some of our regressive kids. Right. Um, but it will pick up the kids who are, um, you know, going along and not use, utilizing that eye contact. And we know that that happens somewhere around one year of age that it can be picked up more easily by the parent. You do see it sometimes in some of the research projects between six months and 12 months. Right. But it's, it's more subtle uh, and stuff, and it's hard to pick up. But the parents can pick it up after a year of age. Believe it or not, we're already well beyond the halfway point of the show here, and I want to make sure that we give everybody an opportunity to say something. So, uh, again, any time I ask you a question, if any of you feel like you want to respond, uh, do please uh, do so, because I want to make sure we also get into contact information and so forth. Um, but it, it, it sounds like the, the two of you are talking about something that you had mentioned to me earlier, the, the autism diagnostic uh, observation schedule. Uh, that's where you have the, the different age ranges. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, but there's also a toolkit, uh, and, and if any of you are, uh, have experience with it, uh, please do chime in on this. And that's something developed by Autism Speaks the, and the, the uh, what is it, Autism uh, Network? Yeah, I think, it, I think it was developed, you may know more about this, but it was the Autism Speaks, and they do a 100-day toolkit for um, kids with quote-unquote lower functioning autism. Mm -hmm. Now they have a higher functioning autism toolkit for kids that maybe have more language and stuff and it's it's a really comprehensive downloadable PDF you know 166 page um, you know compendium of things you know what do you do when you first find out the diagnosis what do you do to find uh, people to help you you know and it goes through the first 100 days of getting the diagnosis and um, I find them I get parents that that's the first thing I send them when, when we make the diagnosis and stuff. I, I want to jump ahead here because I got five minutes left, but I want to make sure that we give contact information for <coughs> each and every one of you, uh, and so that I don't throw a real curve to my uh, uh, director in the studio there, in the control room. Um, I, I think well, let's start with you, uh, Teresa. Where can someone get in touch with the Autism Society of Tidewater? Well, we're conveniently located um, on Virginia Beach Boulevard, 6300 East Virginia Beach Boulevard. It's between Kinsville and Newtown Road. Um, it's a center of independent living building, uh, a SIL. And um, mm -hmm. we're upstairs. We have a lending library up there where there is material that's related to autism in our journey that can be checked out. We have workstations available for families to access um, autism related programs and mm. make and take. We also have a list of physicians, um, psychiatrists and things like that that our families have used in the past as well. Uh, and uh, Dr. Harrington, how can someone, uh, 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 my director is going to have to find this information to put up on the screen, but uh, uh, what is your contact information, sir? So I'm right down the road from here at CHKD um, at the General Academic Pediatrics Practice. Um, and, you know, we basically service all children um, in, in this area and stuff. And uh, generally, you know, it's, it's hard to reach us, to be honest, because we are an academic practice. We have residents Understood. and medical students. Um, we see about 30,000 kids a year. So um, in order for me to do some of my things, I, I have specific appointments for children with autism that I will have them come in and initially uh, see them and get them oriented and stuff. And then they can go back to their regular pediatricians if they like. Um, or if they're old enough, I, I send them to Dr. Madrin, believe it or not, um, okay. because they can't see me on a regular basis Understood. after they reach 21. 
So in terms of uh, in terms of that, that's the best way they can call six six eight seven four hundred to reach our practice. Dr. Hogman. I can be reached at Eastern Virginia Medical School at the Autism Spectrum Pro um, Disorders Program and um, probably a good phone number for that is 446-5888, that's our department's phone number. And the same as Dr. Harrington was mentioning, we are academic also, which means we are not always in person reachable right away, but Understood. our staff tracks us down. And I wanted to say the spectrum program that we have, one of its beauties is, is that we have it from early on, basically one to two years of age, all the way into adulthood. So we really wanted this to be somewhat of an umbrella program um, to cover older adolescents and also adults. And we actually diagnose middle-aged people sometimes middle -aged as well. whose children may have been diagnosed and they come then. Thank right. you. Dr. Madrin, your contact information. Well, I, I want to recognize everyone else here as wonderful experts that I refer to quite regularly. Uh, I'm a, a family physician in general practice. I'm at Princess Anne Medical Associates. We're located at the Princess Anne Complex uh, in Virginia Beach. And uh, uh, my practice, as I say, includes children and adults, uh, both patients who are on the spectrum of autism as well as uh, patients with all sorts of uh, common health ailments. Um, typically, new patients with autism at my practice, uh, we spend an hour evaluating them so it gives me ample opportunity to obtain a, a detailed history from the parents to a very careful observation and develop an assessment and plan to help them going forward. Well guys, I want to thank you for coming on to the show. I'm looking forward to the next two editions. We have a lot to cover and it's going to be very, very exciting. Thank you so very much for lending your expertise to this important topic. And uh, I'll see most of you in, uh, in about a month. Mm -hmm. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And we want to thank you for joining us for this edition of Health Watch. Remember, you can catch previous editions of Health Watch online at www.norfolk.gov. Just click on the Norfolk TV tab, and you can see links to all of the programs produced by the Norfolk Neighborhood Network. If you'd like to drop me a line, you can email me at terrence.acker-anderson at vdh.virginia.gov. Please also feel free to give me a call at 757-683-8836. Again, that's 757-683-8836. For the Norfolk Department of Public Health, I'm Terrence Affer-Anderson, and this has been Health Watch.